I'm excited to bring to you part two of the message that we started last Sunday entitled The Danger of Dabbling. How many of you were here last Sunday? Let me just see by a show of hands. And then there were some of you that weren't. That's okay. You could catch part one on our YouTube channel and, uh, and fill in the gap. But just to summarize briefly the dangers of dabbling, I'm going to read from our anchor text, which is found in Revelation chapter 3. So if you want to turn there with me, we're going to read Revelation chapter 3. Just two verses, verse 15 and 16. If you remember, this is a letter to the church in Laodicea. And in verse 15, it says, Jesus speaking, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And the context of all of that is Jesus is condemning spiritual complacency and indifference. That's really what we started talking about last week. And uh, I just want to give you again the, some definitions just for a bit more context before we get straight into this message for today, part two. Dabbling. What does dabbling mean in our context, the danger of dabbling? Well, dabbling is simply defined like this. Engaging in something in a shallow, inconsistent, or half-hearted manner without full commitment or serious investment. You dabble a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And we talked last week, I'll just highlight them. Dabbling, what does it look like in life in a practical way? We do it in relationships, in careers, in health, in hobbies and skills, and even with our time management. I'm not going to expound on that, but those were the five areas we touched on. A very practical message, but really the invitation was in those areas, are we fully committed to even those areas and then surrendering them to God so that He can use us in the very practical aspects of life? But... In, in the church, it also matters greatly. In our spiritual, when I say the church, I'm not saying when we're gathered in this building. We are the church. So in our lives as the church, dabbling is a very dangerous thing when it comes to spiritual matters. And today, with God's help, that's where I want us to spend our time. So what does dabbling look like? In the church. And this is where we're going to spend our time. Again, the anchor text, Revelation 3, verse 15 and 16. So Jesus was addressing the spiritual complacency and indifference. You're neither hot, you're neither cold. If you were here, just a bit more context on that letter to the church in Laodicea. There were two aqueducts. It was a very good city, but their one issue was water. And so they had these two aqueducts that water would travel to the city. One was from uh, a hot spring, and it was believed that it had healing properties with it. So it was very useful when it was hot. The other was cold and refreshing. But the thing is, by the time it would travel through the, the aqueducts to the city of Laodicea, the water would become lukewarm. So what Jesus is actually telling them in its proper historical context is they would have understood, you know, you don't want the lukewarm water. It loses its ability to be refreshing and it loses its ability to have those healing qualities about it. And lukewarmness is, you don't want it. You spit it out. And Jesus, that's basically what he was using so that the people would understand, oh, this is what he means. It's, it's, it's useless, basically. And so today, with God's help, let's look at what it looks like when we begin to dabble as a Christian. In the life God has called you and I to lead. Number one is, when we start to dabble with, in our faith, we actually attend church sporadically. The commitment like Hebrews 10.25 says, says, don't neglect the meeting together as some people are in the habit of doing. There's an importance. I preached the message on this a few weeks ago. There's the importance of the church coming together. 
that we need to be in the same room. That miracles happen when we call on the name of the Lord together. Where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. Attending church sporadically is that lukewarmness. And some people, it, it shows in our attendance. Now, some of you, I know, you work online or you travel a lot. And you, like, I'm not here to like nitpick on people that you, you share with me your comings and your goings. But listen... If you're here today, I'm glad you're here. If you're here and it's sporadic and it's based on life and f how you feel on a certain weekend, you know, my question is, how is your commitment to the Lord? Are you just, or are you just dabbling? Right? It's not a tell-all sign, but, I, and listen, I don't care about attendance. Like, I'm not here with a notepad writing names of people I don't see. We care if you're not here because we want to make sure you're okay. Make sure you're not drifting. But all you have to do to drift is what? Nothing. We were on vacation in August. And we were like the waves were really big at Sabo Beach this one day. And I'll tell you what. Where we started, we had the two chairs and the umbrella or the tent rather. And I began to see my kids slowly but surely making their way really off from where we asked them to be. So then I had lifeguard duties that day. And I was running and I was saying, hey! And they couldn't. It was so loud. The waves were crashing down. And then I had to literally start going halfway in the water towards them to say, get back. And I said, see this line? Stay within the line. I wasn't angry, but I wanted to make sure they did not drift and all you have to do to drift is nothing when you begin to dabble it's like doing nothing well it's whatever wherever the water and the waves and wind will take me that's not what God has called us to be as his church and so instead of just maybe showing up occasionally or when it's convenient when we are fully committed to the Lord we're committing to regular fellowship and spiritual growth. What I've noticed in my almost 20 years, next year will be 20 years of pastoring. It's crazy to think. I don't feel old. I still think I'm 18 most of the time, in my head at least. But what I've seen is the drift happens. And then when life comes crashing down, it's suddenly like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm, where am I? Where, where am I? You lose your bearings. But when life hits, it's like, Oh, I got to get back to church. Oh, I got to get praying again. Oh, I got to. And why do we wait that we drift so far into oblivion for life to happen and then realize, where am I? It's not, where is God? I think the right question is, where am I and how did I get here? God has never changed. He's consistent. The question is, where are we? And so I need to move on to the next point. But when we begin to dabble in our faith with Jesus Christ, it usually starts to show up in uncommitted attendance at church. But listen, we're called to unite. We're called to serve. Get in a connect group. That's why they're important. Sunday has to be, the Christian life, excuse me, has to be more than just 90 minutes on a Sunday. So don't get me wrong, being here is the first sign, but be invested in the life of the church as well. Which leads to number two, involvement in ministry. When I'm just a dabbler, I'm not involved in ministry. When I'm fully committed to the Lord, I can't help but recognize the calling and ministry that God has. Not for me as a pastor, for me as a Christian. For me and you, we are the priesthood. We are. And so our involvement in ministry matters. Individuals might volunteer maybe in church or in ministries, but with minimal investment. Meaning, if it's convenient, I'll do it. If it fits my schedule or my preference, I'll do it. Instead, a committed person says, Lord, I want to serve consistently in a way that brings glory to you. And God, I want it to 
cost my all. That's what fully committed looks like. Or else, what are you actually giving to the Lord and his body? And so this isn't a mess. I, I'm not hearing a lot of amens, but listen, I'm not preaching for amens. I love the, mmm, the, <laughs> ouch. Because sometimes that's more appropriate than saying, so be it, Lord, because that's what amen means. If you mean it, say amen, amen. And, and then live out the word. Live it out. Jesus says, don't be lukewarm of no use or little use. Be refreshing, be on fire, be both, but don't be in the middle. Number three is prayer and Bible reading. And these aren't in order of importance, by the way, but this is very important. Prayer and Bible reading. A lukewarm approach leads to spiritual stagnation. Have you ever been around a little pond where there's no movement? And it's just like, ugh. And then your child just like runs and like puts their foot in it or falls in. My kids don't do that, thank God. But if they did, I'd have to jump in and save them, right? Some of you are in that stagnant pool of murky, gross water. And spiritually speaking, there are people all around you saying, you got to get out. You got to get back to your first love. You got to get back to the thing, the one that really matters. And, you know, one of the telltale signs, if you don't bring a Bible to church, I wonder, are you reading it at home? Pastor John, you're stepping on. No. And I understand for convenience, we have it in our phones. You know my, you know, it's funny. Let me just side note for a second. When pastor friends tell me, hey, you preach with a Bible on your pulpit, I'm like, what, <laughs> what else am I going to preach from? I understand they read it off their iPad, but this is the living word. Yes, it, you can read the actual Bible on your device, but there's nothing to me that compares to holding the patent. Yes, it's just, you know... I buy expensive Bibles, by the way. That's why some of you are like, how does he fold his Bible like this and it doesn't break? Because it's genuine leather. I pay good money for my Bibles. Why? Because I beat them up. Not beat people up with it. I use my Bible. Why? Well, this is a sword that we get to carry wherever we go. Can it live in your heart? Well, it better. But it also lives in your hand. And you need to read the living word. And you've heard me say this, but as you read the living word, you, the more you read it, the more you recognize and realize the living word reads you. Amen. Hebrews chapter 4 says it's alive and active and it cuts straight through bone and marrow, dividing straight to the core of who you are. And for some of us, that's very uncomfortable but I'm telling you, I, I would rather God expose my heart before him as I read his word than someone else expose me. And so, Lord, you have the words of life, they said about Jesus. To whom else will we go? This is the living word of God that we've been given. Some of you are like, I need to buy that Bible. I'll post a link on Instagram. You could click it, whatever you want. I'll do, I'll do it probably by Monday. Don't worry. But And I told my kids, by the way, these Bibles that Daddy has, I highlight, I underline, I preach from them through the years. And some of them, when I bought the cheaper ones earlier on, they're like all cracked and broken. But I said, I'm going to give to each of you one of Daddy's Bibles that I've preached from. You'll find highlights and underlines and little side notes and things like that. I said, that's probably the best heirloom, the best gift that Daddy could leave you is my Bible. And so, when we dabble, why can I spend literally five minutes right now just talking about the Word? Because it matters in my life. Not because I'm a pastor, because I know that that judgment is easy to cast. Because I'm a son of God. And I care what my Father wants me to know 
and, and the standard and principles that he wants me to live by. So again, a lukewarm approach leads to spiritual stagnation. People might pray or read a scripture only when you feel like it. And some of us live on, you know, you have the Bible app on your phone and it's like, well, you don't lick your finger. I'm so used to reading my actual Bible, but you just swipe to see what's the verse of the day. You read it and you're like, okay, thank you, God. That's, that's the verse I'm going to stand on today. And like, that's very, it's good. Don't get me wrong. But if that's like all that you take in all day, and you probably forget it 30 seconds after you read it. Let's be honest. Yes? We're dabbling. We're dabbling. Make prayer and reading your Bible a consistent and intentional habit. Why, Pastor John? Well, let me talk about the word a little bit. Psalm 119, verse 11. Thy word... Have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you? You need the word in you, not just with you, in you, in your heart. Psalm 119, same psalm, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. You want direction? Get in God's word. He speaks to you from the volume of this book, this holy book. It's a collection of 66 books, actually. And then Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass, by the way, no matter how tall it grows on some of our properties, it will wither. The flower, no matter how beautiful it might look, it will fade. But the word of God will stand forever. How can I treat it as just words on a page or something that I just launch an app and just get the notification for the verse of the day? The words of life. Jesus overcame temptation in the wilderness, in the desert, when Satan tried to tempt him three times and challenge his identity as the Son of God. And he always overcame with what? The Word. I can't overstate it today. But... If you're not in the word and you're not praying, you're just dabbling. What is prayer? Let me break that down just really briefly. Prayer is having a conversation with God. In the same way I talk with my wife, we have a relationship. If you have a relationship with God the Father, the disciples said, Jesus teaches how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us not our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus gave them a model to pray, but it starts with acknowledging relationship, our Father in heaven, and then how holy he is. It puts things into perspective. And so don't think like, well, I, you know, I've drifted, I've wandered, and I'm afraid to approach God. No, no, no. Come before him. When Adam and Eve sinned and they were hiding, God sought them out. Don't forget that. So don't think I've sinned, I'm too dirty for God to hear my prayers. God sought them out and said, Adam, Adam, where are you? Oh, we're hiding. Why are you hiding? And God asks those questions so that we can confess the sin and then come out of hiding and then live again in right relationship with Him. For us, it's only because of the finished work of the cross. Our sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. And by the way, He moves them as far as the east is from the west. And now through the righteousness of Christ, not by my works, but he sees me now through the imputed righteousness of Christ. So prayer and reading your Bible will, will foster that relationship. That when life comes and the troubles come and the storms come, you know God's word. And you have everything you need to be successful. But if you're not reading and you're not praying, I'm just here to remind you, maybe you're just dabbling in your relationship with Christ. The next one is giving and serving. And I promise you we're almost done. Giving and serving. Some may give financially or serve occasionally. 
but only when it doesn't inconvenience them. Again, a lot of it comes back to convenience. Listen, Christianity is familiar with inconvenience. If you take nothing else, just remember that. If it feels inconvenient, chances are it's probably good for you. <laughs> I preached, I remember years ago, a series leading up to Easter on the path of inconvenience, which journeyed, you know, showing Christ leading up to the cross. It was the path of inconvenience, but Jesus did it. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. But some of us, we only serve if it's convenient. So listen, giving and serving. Instead of doing it occasionally or only when it's convenient, let's see our resources or our time as a part of our overall stewardship as a Christian. That means, God, I recognize what you've blessed me with, and now I need to give back. I need to do it. As a Christian, and if you're new to Weston, like you heard Francesca in the video say, hey, if you want to give, it's as much as she said, you know, to bless the ministry, it's actually to bless you. Yeah. And so, Pastor, maybe we'll, we're going to adjust that so it accurately reflects the heart behind the action. We, we don't say give because we need the lights. You know, we have to pay bills. You'll never, as long as it is me up here, you'll never hear it from the platform or the pulpit when it comes around giving time. Give because we have bills to pay. No, no, no. We lead with ministry, and money always follows ministry. And, and that's just how the Lord orders it. We have a vision from the Lord, and we faithfully carry out the vision that God is asking, that he wants to see happen. And guess what? He has to ensure that there's provision for the vision. So this is how we lead at Weston. And scripture has a lot to say about how we give of our resources, of our time. If we're going to do it, we do it out of a love for his kingdom and to see his kingdom advance. When it comes to giving of our, our tithes and offerings, Matthew 23, 23, Jesus said, yes, you should tithe. Yeah. You should tithe. So if Jesus said we should tithe, then I better tithe. Tithe simply means one-tenth of my income. Some of you, we had a couple of testimonies months ago, but you say, Pastor John, is it off of my net or my gross? I'm not here to tell you, but... Just because the government says I owe them some money doesn't mean that then I start with God there. No, I tithe off of the gross. And I say, if this is on paper, what the salary is that I'm making, I don't care what the government touches, then Lord, I tithe. My wife and I do it like that. I'm not here to tell you or to tell you you're right or wrong. Just that's our personal conviction. And the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 9, that he supplies more seed to the sower. And I look at money as seed in my hand. And if I hold on to the seed, I will never see a harvest. Why? Seed is meant to go in the ground. And when it's planted in good soil, that's the key. The environment is important, but the soil better be good then we're going to see the growth, we're going to see the harvest and the multiplication thereof. And so I can't tell you, I can't convince you that Weston is good soil to sow in. But my prayer is that you would see it for yourself. And if you don't see Weston as good soil, why are you here? Right? You say, Pastor, you're talking like that. What if half the people leave? That's okay. We're not here about the money. But I'm here to also teach you God's word has a lot to say about it. And money can't have you. You have money. Money doesn't have you. And one of those ways that we ensure that that always stays the case is we make sure that we are givers first. The Bible says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And so when I dabble, though, I'm like... A $20 bill in the offering. If that's not your 10% of what you earn, 
It's just like a little tip in the bucket. And God is, when Jesus stood in the temple, he was watching. I don't watch. I don't know what anyone gives, and I'm glad. Because I treat you all the same as a result. Somebody say amen. 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 But the Lord is different. Acts 10, Cornelius, his gifts, the angel of the Lord appeared and said, your gifts have been received by God in heaven. He's seen what you, how you've been generous, how you've been giving to the poor and the needy as well. And so I need to move on. But some of you, like, because we don't mention giving a lot, I don't want you to think that it's not vital and important. Instead, the last thing I'll say, if you call yourself a Christian, you shouldn't need a pastor or a video announcement to remind you of your obligation and your love for the Lord. That that's why and that's the motive why we give. And, and by the way, Weston, you are a generous people. I'm telling you. I don't preach you, you, like, you know, we need this and we need that. And so if you could kindly give tithes and offerings. If there's obviously a special need or an event or something, we'll bring that before you. But listen, I'd rather teach you, and we're in a great position, I'd rather teach you now than have to come to you when, when we're like, you know, people aren't giving and we need you to step up. That, that's depressing. That's depressing. And, and that's not the kind of church that I believe Jesus wants me to lead or wants us to be. But if we're not giving and we call ourselves Christians, we're dabbling. And it's not, when I say giving now, it's not just the money. It's of your time, of your skills, like I talked about last week. And um, Growth Track, we're so grateful many of you are showing your intent to want to get involved to give of your time and of your resource to see ministry happen and thrive in Jesus' name. The last area is community engagement. Dabbling in relationships within the church community, but only building surface relationships. That's a danger of dabbling. Why? Well, you're not connected, you don't have accountability, and you have no support as a result. And listen, there are two parts to this. There's one part, like we offer the connect group, we offer the right ministry, where you find yourself fitting in. But there's the other side of that coin where y you got to be willing. You got to stick your foot and yourself out there a little bit. You, you got to linger around maybe after a Sunday service or a Friday night event. Linger around a bit and maybe get to know one new person's name today before church is over and make a friend. Hey, I'll see you next Friday. I'll see you next Sunday. I'll see you in that men's connect group that's starting or the other connect groups that are starting at the end of this month. You see, we need each other. We are the body. And so it's very important with no accountability, no support, no connectedness to anyone. You're like, what's the value of showing up? What's, where's the power in gathering? It's lost. So it's very important that you are seeing these. Not, these are not as much practical as I view them as spiritual things. It is important that we are connected. And I want to end this sermon this morning. I'm going to call the worship team to come back. I've asked them to sing a song in just a minute, but I need your focus still because I want to talk on a few more verses. In Numbers chapter 14, there's a special verse. The context is there the, the 12 spies are scoping out the promised land. You might remember this story, but the majority of them come back with a negative report, but Joshua and Caleb have a different report. There is a special verse that it's easy to miss it, found in Numbers 14, verse 24, but I want you to get this this morning. Check this out. It says, but my servant Caleb... Because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully. 
and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Why is it important? Because basically that whole generation was not going to receive the promise. They said it will only be for the children. But it was different for Caleb. He said there was a different spirit about this one. And he followed me fully. Not haphazardly, half-heartedly, no dabbling about his way. But he followed the Lord fully. Isn't it interesting that that would be recorded about his life? Of all the things that he probably could have been noted and remembered for, it was that he had a different spirit about him, different attitude. No doubt the hand of God maybe is evidenced on him and his life. But for me, the thing that stands out, it wasn't just the one thing. There's a different spirit about him. And he followed me fully. That means that heaven takes notice of the commitment that you choose to make today. To say, God, with all of my heart, I'm going to follow you fully. That means come hell or high water, that commitment doesn't change, church. And I know some of you have been through the fire. I understand. Some of you, your faith has been tested. I get it. Some of you, you've been challenged to the core of who you are. For whatever the reason, it's different for everyone. But may it be said of us, I followed him fully. And not just for one season, but in every season. I followed him fully. Even when it cost much, I followed him fully. There's one more verse I want to share with you. And then we're going to sing this song called Available. In 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking to strengthen who? Those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. The eyes of the Lord are searching today for men and women who will be faithful. And when he finds you, he's saying, I'm going to strengthen that commitment. I'm going to strengthen your knees so that you can stand firm. I'm going to strengthen your hands so you can take a new grip again and stand even when it hurts.